So this is again about liver procedure number one, how to apply it, uh, which forms to use, and uh, this is video number five. So this is the last part. It's the last video, video number five, uh, concerning the cube method and its application on the ground and following up from what we discussed before concerning the Q method and some of the principles that go along with it. The cherry picking, the anonymous data collection, and the need for privacy in the interview process. Following up to that, we want to cover uh, some of the specifics concerning the form itself. And this comes from notes uh, of, of a previous training of surveyors that happened uh, in January. There was a booster training sometime in April. And right now we're repeating this. Uh, so I'll be reading from the notes from uh, Professor Tomás Lopes Cavalheiro Ponce Dentinho, who's a specialist in the Q method. Uh, Professor uh, Tomás Dentinho, he is a part of the uh, EBD Global Optimum sub-team uh, implementing this project. Together with myself, I'm Fabiana Isler and Alicia, we're here to help you uh, with any methodological uh, questions that you may have concerning the application of the LOVRA. On the ground, you have Eva and a wonderful team of field surveyors, uh, people who have a lot of experience and will support you all the way through. And obviously there's Antea from uh, Antea Group Belgium, who uh, is preparing the remainder of the uh, methodology, preparing the comprehensive risk assessment in Timorous. Now, uh, I just want to recap. Uh, before the interview, make sure that you have an empty copies of the questionnaire on paper. You have a, a pen, a board with the questions and cards that have been numbered. And all of this material has been translated into Tatum. You have your mobile phone charge to identify coordinates, and you do that using the uh, application of UTM. You have a map of the SUKU uh, in order to actually define the place where you are at in, in case you don't have um, uh, mobile uh, coverage or GPS coverage. You need to uh, plan how many questionnaires you are able to apply during day, day two uh, in, in the SUKU. And you do that uh, when you're doing, for example, the transect walk, transect walk or when you're doing the focus group. Um, you identify through the cherry picking, which had been discussed in video number three, uh, the people who will be interviewed. We think that a quick Q method interview would last 30 minutes, but let's say up to you know 40 minutes in average. But to be really, really sure, you need to reserve a full hour. Even getting to the person's uh, place, uh, you know, finding the, the peace and quiet that you need, the privacy that you need, that in and of itself takes time. So therefore, prepare for that. Prepare for one hour for each interview. Uh, so again, you need to find a place during the interview without wind or rain, and preferably with a table and chairs. And you sit face to face with the interviewee. Uh, you need enough light because you need to read uh, the questions. Uh, and you proceed, the inter proceed with the interview without hurry, without breaks. Okay, it's very important that the interview is conducted from beginning to end without a break. You need to ask the interviewee for consent. We've gone through the steps of the consent. I've read the consent in English. You will be reading the consent, a well-translated consent in Tatum. Need to make sure that everything is well understood. Repeat the, uh, the paragraphs in the consent if they have not been understood. After the interview, you need to fill in the Google form. It's form number three. Uh, and if you're doing it on paper, you need to use block letters so that we can understand the questions or whoever is responsible for data entry can understand what is being written. Uh, and it's very, very important that all the questions in the Q method form, form number three, are complete. If you leave out a single question, the entire interview process for Q method is invalidated. So it's very important to be thorough, complete, and to do the interview without breaks. 
Now there are cards numbered and, and the, the V can also uh, serve as A, V for vulnerability, A for adaptation or adaptive capacity. We'll cover now there are cards numbered and, and the, the V can also uh, serve as A, V for vulnerability, A for adaptation or adaptive capacity. We'll cover so it's very important to have all the boards ready when you start uh, asking the question. And uh, we're going to go through them uh, in more detail because this is all about ranking and ranking preferences, ranking the different things that are listed in the questions. Uh, for question number one, we have the following boards. We have floods, landslides, erosion, extreme winds, drought hazard, and uncontrolled fires. For the second question, the person will also be asked to rank the different assets and services differently from the previous question where you have six things to order uh, and rank. Here we have eight, so therefore, you're going to use the eight cards. What we have here are houses, agricultural fields, livestock, forests, road, water supply, energy supply, which is generally electricity, health posts, and schools. Uh, just Pay close attention to what these features are. These are assets that are present in the community, and you may be asked to explain what they are. But the question here is to rank what is most important for the person. And you have eight cards. All of them need to be filled. If they say, oh, but this is not important for me, then you move it to the bottom of the rank, but ask them to rank all eight things in order of importance. This question, this is question three, is uh, very much about uh, the attitudes, people's attitudes in the face of destruction of uh, assets by natural hazards. And it so happens in the Q method that people associate the previous questions with what they're being asked next. So this is the beauty of it. So here you, you be asking, what is your most likely attitude in the face of the destruction of, nat of assets by uh, natural hazards? And you're again asking the person to rank the different options. And there are no other options besides those that are being listed here. It's very important that they rank all of the six options according to what is their most likely attitude? And you need to repeat the question in case there is misunderstanding. And the options are to do nothing, or to migrate to other places, to ask for support from the authorities, to mobilize local means, to mobilize family support, to move to a safer location within the circle and these are the six options so with the six cards you will explain these things if they're not clear to the person and ask them to rank what will be the most uh, likely um, attitude question number four is what is what people's concerns what people's expectations are from the authorities when these assets are destroyed by natural hazards. And again, they're being asked to rank. And here we have also six options. And the options are no public interference, regulate the management of common assets, forbid the location of assets in risky areas, provide subsidies and materials for repairing infrastructures, rebuild damaged assets, strengthen disaster preparedness. If they ask you more specifically, what does it mean to regulate the management of common assets? 
So this is, uh, for example, to say that uh, uh, natural pasture uh, needs to be uh, controlled, uh, to say that um, access to certain areas, to certain roads, also needs to follow certain rules. Uh, and it sometimes boils down to forbidding, to actually telling people that they must not go to a specific area, but it's different from regulating, and you need to be able to explain this. And when we say common assets, we're talking about the assets, the houses, the infrastructure, the natural assets, that belong to everybody, belong to the public. For example, schools or health posts or roads, or all of the assets there are common. And in Timor-Leste, sometimes there are natural areas that are public, are common assets as well. Common here is uh, belonging to everybody, belonging to the community, belonging to no one, non-private assets. With all the cards in place and with a good understanding of these questions, you will be ready to start the Q-Method interview. And it starts with filling in uh, some basic data. It's very important that you as a surveyor identify yourself and not the person being surveyed. Again, this is an anonymous data collection method. You will identify the suku, you will identify the aldea and the municipality in form number three online. Uh, the selection of suku is uh, from a, a drop-down menu according to municipality. The date is important. You also want to uh, indicate if you identified this person for the Q method interview through the focus group discussion. You also identify if the person's house location is within the risk zone according to Antea's uh, uh, risk zone mapping. And you will identify as precisely as possible the, the coordinates of the person's uh, house, their household. I'll not repeat myself too much, but it's very important to rank. So depending on what the person says, you put down the, the cards uh, and you fill in all of the options. Uh, which one is number one and then number two? First priority is landslides, followed by floods, followed by drought hazard, followed by erosion, followed by extreme winds. And last, this person would have prioritized uncontrolled fires. So this is how a hypothetical person will answer uh, question number one by ranking the sixth most relevant assets according to the person's own perceptions. Again, we're measuring perceptions. On to uh, question number two, which is about the assets and the services. You will again ask what's most important to you. And there are eight things that the person needs to rank. Uh, it's very likely that they'll say that the house is the most important, but don't force the answer. You need to let them choose what's most important to them. You might be surprised that they say that agricultural fields are the most important. So don't force the answer. Just give them the time to understand, analyze, explain the cards if need be, and let them choose. Okay? If they say that number two, it's the road, so you bring down number two. If they say that livestock is number three, you take note of that. Number four, if they say that finally it's agricultural fields. And then water supply, followed by the health posts and schools. And last but not least, they might say uh, that uh, water supply followed by forests are the least important for them. So that's how they ranked. That's how you're going to take note of it. It's very important that you leave no row without a number. Next, uh, it's the, the question that follows. What is the most likely attitude in the face of destruction of assets by natural hazards? Again, don't force the answer. Let them answer according to their preferences and explain what each sentence here means. 
so that they fully understand, but let them do the ranking, what's most important for, for them. Uh, if they say that, you know, their most likely attitude is just to do nothing, that's what you take note of uh, in this particular case here, which is hypothetical. Followed by, well, then I'll look for family support. That goes as number two. And then, okay, maybe I can mobilize local means. That will be my sort of a third option here, third uh, likely attitude in this particular case. Um, I'll then ask for help from the authorities. You take note of that as number four. And you need six, don't forget. Followed by move to a safer location that's really down on the person's priority list. And uh, finally, migrate to other places. So this is how you need to take note of it. What's uh, most important, most likely attitude and least likely attitude from one to six. And this is uh, question number four. What measures do you expect from the authorities when assets are destroyed by natural hazards? If they say they expect no public interference, this is what you put as number one. If they expect that uh, after that they may provide in subsidies and materials for repairing infrastructure, that will be their number two. Again, don't force the answer. Don't let the answer be biased. Let them really answer according to their preferences. If they expect that next, the uh, authorities will rebuild damaged assets. That's what comes as number three. Forbid the location of assets in risky areas. If they say that this is number four, strengthen disaster preparedness. If this is what they expect from the authorities as number five out of uh, six options, so that's how you take note of it. And finally, that the authorities do something about regulating the management of common assets. This is question number five, and it has 5A and 5B. 5A is about vulnerability, 5B is about adaptive capacity. In a sense, they are opposites, vulnerability and adaptive capacity. But here you're asking the person, it's a very personal question, how they assess their own degree of vulnerability according to a five-point scale. Five-point scale means there are five options that go from high vulnerability to very high vulnerability to very low vulnerability. And you can explain to them what vulnerability is that is when you know they are impacted by a natural hazard that they have certain features, certain characteristics that make them more susceptible to be impacted by these hazards. Uh, and these are characteristics that they can not change very much. This is what vulnerability is about. And there's a, the, the cards look more or less like this. It's the V card, if you may remember. And then uh, you're going to place the V card according to this uh, rainbow scale, the five point scale from a very high vulnerability to very low vulnerability. That is followed by question 5B, which is about adaptive capacity. Because you may be highly vulnerable, but you may also have adaptive capacity. And this is again a very personal question to the individual that, you're being, that you are interviewing. If you don't have the A card for adaptive capacity, you can just invert the V card and make it into an A. And then, um, you know, how, ask them to place their adaptive capacity as either very high, uh, all the way down to very low in a five point scale. Finally, there are some few questions that are very important. Some of them, will be answered by the respondent. Others will be answered by you observing the surroundings and observing what's going on. Uh, but you continue the interview and you go all the way to the end. You ask the person's age, number of years of education, their gender. Don't just observe their gender, ask them. Daily income, uh, whether they have car, whether they have a car, and car uh, goes, we're using the exact same typology as we have in the census. Car, van, truck, anguna. Motorcycle, 
if they also own a motorcycle. And here the options are yes or no, so it's one or zero. What's their uh, occupation? Uh, if they are farmer, if they work for government, or other, uh, whether they live on a hill, on a plain, or by the coast, and how long it takes to reach Delhi by transport in terms of number of hours. Don't just guess that, ask the person. In case they don't know, then you can write down the number of hours if you know from experience how long it takes by transport, but better ask the Suka residents, okay? Just in case they don't know, you would put the answer yourself. Um, time to reach the local market within the Suku by foot. So you write down the number of minutes. So this is the, the previous one, number of hours. The next one, number of minutes. How many people live with you in the house, in the household, including you? So we really need to know how many people are in the household. The area of agricultural land used by the household, we're assuming that they actually have land that they are using for agriculture. In case they don't, your answer will be zero. But the number of hectares, this is an estimation, okay? Uh, if they don't know, you just help them out to try and measure, but we need a measure in hectares. Number of cows and buffaloes, just put them together. It doesn't matter how many cows or buffaloes. An estimate that belongs to the household. Number of goats and sheep that belong to the household. Again, an estimate, uh, whether it's the small uh, sheep and goat or the, the big one, it doesn't matter. We just need to have an idea of how many there are. Finally, some characteristics of the respondent. And, uh, this is uh, what it looks like in, in Tetum, sorry. This is the seventh question. It concerns the features of the house that the interviewee lives in and you will ask them uh, very precisely and the answer is a, a single letter um, as follows. You're going to ask if the materials of the person's uh, house, if the walls are made of concrete brick, that will be uh, option A, of wood, uh, bamboo, that will be option B, corrugated iron or zinc, option C, clay, palm, uh, trunk, or bebak rock, that will be uh, option D. And finally, any other material that has not listed before will be option E. Next, you ask, the, you ask about the roof materials and you need to select one of them. Option A, palm leaves, tali tahan, thatch, or grass, that will be option A. Option B, corrugated iron or zinc. Option B, bamboo, option C, and any other material not listed before, option D. Next uh, question, still concerning the person's house, access to public infrastructure from the respondent's residence. And these are all yes or no questions. And you're gonna mark one for yes, zero for no whether uh, they have access to a paved road, to a non-paved road for cars, if they have uh, water supply in their house, public water supply, uh, if they have a public electrification in their house, if there's a school within four kilometers of their house, and if there's a health post within four kilometers of their house. I, finally, this is the last question, question number A of the Q method and all of the uh, forms that you're supposed to apply in the field. It's also about memory of hazard. You may recall we had a question, memory of hazard during the focus group interview. This is similar, but again, we're asking the individual. So they need to respond according to their memory of hazard and not the collective memory of hazard. And the questions are if um, the hazard has affected the suku, affected their assets, you can say your assets, that is the interviewee's assets, the year of the hazard, whether it's been loss of life, estimated financial loss in US dollar for every specific hazard, 
uh, and how long it took to recover, whether in days, weeks, or, or months, and you're going to answer with a small piece of text. We have room for more than the uh, six uh, types of hazards that were included in question one of the Q method. And in the form, you have a, a place to be to indicate that. Okay, and these are the questions in, in Tetum. I believe there is some translation missing, but this can be fixed uh, uh, very soon. So this is all for this is this is all for my part. This is the very last uh, slide, and I thank you for all the attention uh, in the instructional videos for the LOVRA procedure. Thank you. Bye. The government of Timor-Leste is implementing, with the support of the United Nations Development Program and funding from the Green Climate Fund, a project titled Safeguarding Rural Communities and the Fiscal Assets from Climate-Induced Disasters in Timor-Leste. This video and related materials are funded by the project. Government entities involved in the project include the Secretariat of State of Environment, under the Coordinating Minister of Economic Affairs as the implementing partner, along with the following entities as responsible parties, Ministry of State Administration, Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries, Ministry of Public Works and the Secretariat of State of Civil Protection, companies, Antea Belgium, part of the Antea Group, EBD Global Optimum of Rio de Janeiro, and the NGO Hivos at timor -Lashi are the joint venture of service providers for the assignment titled Comprehensive Climate Hazard Mapping and Risk Assessment and Development of a Risk Model for Timor-Leste under the mentioned project.